Okay, perfect. So hi everyone, my name is Steve Dalton. Um, I'm the 2IC apparently of this conference. I don't know if I'm doing a good job or not, I'll probably find out on Thursday. Um, I had a totally different talk planned. I was actually going to do a lot of live demos and things like that. And then my laptop uh, the other day has been sending me some really horrible signals that it's about to have a major hardware failure. You know, fan errors, all sorts of weird reboots. I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. So I actually uh, just late last night rewrote my whole presentation. So it's, uh, and it's going to be an interactive session. I've got lots of things to show you as well, lots of pictures, and I want to make it really interactive so you guys can ask me a question anytime. You don't have to wait to the end, and we'll just get through however which we can get through. So um, my name is, we okay on the cameras, guys? Yes. Yep. My name is Steve Dalton. Uh, I do lots and lots of things, trying to do less things at the moment because I have split myself very, very wide. And uh, after talking to the, so the um, councillor yesterday, I realised I am definitely in the burnout. So I'm trying to get myself out of the burnout quadrant. Uh, one of the things I'm doing at the moment, I've started a new business and I'm supposed to closing down a lot of my old stuff. My new business is a hardware business and I've been a software engineer for many years. My new business is a hardware business and it is really, a, 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 I'm going right back to my past. When I came out of uni, I was an electronic engineer and I did hardware. So I'm actually having a lot of fun doing hardware again. So I don't know, out of you guys, does anyone here do hardware? We've got a few hardware people. You don't have to, to get a lot from this talk though. So that's okay. So uh, yeah, if you want to talk to me, you're welcome to uh, email me or whatever. I'm on LinkedIn and things like that. Um, my hobby is also tech, unfortunately. You should, they say you should have hobbies that are not really uh, to do with your job, but my hobby is a thing called the Gold Coast Tech Space that we started um, several years ago. And it's a, it's a hacker space here on the Gold Coast, but we have a little bit of a different feel to other hacker spaces. We're quite family friendly. We have a lot of kids, uh, young people come in. James is one of our young members here. Uh, he might be in the photos somewhere there. Like this was our meeting the other week. We we're all mucking around and we have kids come in doing robots, all sorts of stuff. We go to science fairs, we build crazy sci-fi machines. Uh, we, do, we have a lot of fun. It's, it's heaps of fun actually. Um, and one of the things, uh, I'm the president of the club and the founder of the club. I may not be forever, hopefully someone will take over from me. But one of the things I really have been trying to instill with people with the club is to, um, when I was a kid, when I was seven, I started compute programming with one of these, little Sinclair Spectrum. I didn't think about a job from that thing. I just wanted, it was fun. And I started coding, doing coding. The jobs doing software at the time when I was doing this, that was between 1982, would probably be so boring. I would have not wanted to do programming, but this was fun. Uh, now, and then later on in life, I became a programmer and did all that stuff for, as a job. So at the moment in hardware, we've got a lot of people messing around with hardware and doing hobby things. And they're not thinking about, maybe you could have a job doing this. And I think there are going to be a lot of jobs doing hardware and uh, internet of things and all sorts of little micro things in the future. So I've been trying to um, talk to kids, adults, all sorts of people. Here on the Gold Coast, we actually have quite a lot of people who are unemployed or they're doing kind of fairly mundane jobs they could be doing, and they're in their hobby times, they're doing this amazing stuff. So I'm trying to encourage people to actually take these hobbies and think a little bit bigger. Um, so this is the tech space. That's my son there. They do little Minecraft uh, days, and they were doing Minecraft parties for a while, and all sorts of things. Um, so I'm just going to do a little bit of a backtrack. I talked about uh, me doing the programming. And after university, I actually didn't quite know what I wanted to do. And I became an embedded software engineer. And uh, this is actually the first product I worked on here. This was the 3Com Superstack 1000. It had uh, 12 10 meg ports on there. And I actually wrote all the uh, user interface for this. It was a VT100 interface. You could go in through uh, menus and, and do drop downs, all sorts of crazy stuff we did in text using curses like um, uh, um, um, screens, you could tell me into it too. And later on I worked on this thing, which was the uh, Superstack 3300. And this was a very, very popular device. They sold a lot of these. This went on the space shuttle apparently as one point, one point for trial. So that was really cool having something on the space shuttle. Um, and I wrote the web interface for this. We actually had a web server running on it on a 68,000 processor. Uh, Motorola 68000 and 3Com uh, actually made all their own ASICs. We had ASIC engineers, all these are our 3Com ASICs. They had a 68000 core in here in the controller and then they had their own 
ASIC, which was designed by a whole lot of really smart Irish people to do all the switching. And they did uh, basically cut through switching, very, very low latency switching for Ethernet networks. And uh, it was really cool to be part of this project. And then later on, I worked on the Gigabit Ethernet port for this, which was the first ever Gigabit Ethernet device. We were like way before the standard, so we are working with the, uh, the standards on the ADA2 11 the B or whatever it was uh, standard and, and also an ATM module so uh, Yap will probably know what ATM is and uh, we had an ATM frame uh, module that came out of Israel worked very close with the Israelis uh, for this thing too so this was a lot of fun um, and back in those days uh, yeah we had a lot of proprietary software and tools and we had uh, debug ports this one isn't a debug version uh, you can just see on here this uh, this is where our debug ports would plug in. All the engineers had debug versions of these sitting on their desks, it's and we ran. ATM is asynchronous yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fifty-two byte packets. Everything was affixed. Yeah, and that's what ATM is. What is all your ADSL connections and the covers is ATM on the uh, the low level. Uh, it's crazy protocol though. It's really, really hard. Uh, it was very hard to implement. So. Um, where I was going with that was, uh, yeah, so we had a lot of tools available to us, all sorts of amazing commercial tools that allowed us to do our jobs. Uh, we ran, uh, every engineer had two workstations, a Sun Solaris workstation, and uh, I think it was a Windows machine that ran all our Lotus Notes and email, and then we had a dedicated Unix workstation for doing all our debugging and emulation, simulation, all sorts of stuff like that. And we wrote in C, C++, and also crazy scripting languages that we invented. So. Um, I actually was very, very lucky. I feel very privileged to have gone through a graduate training program to do that because there really isn't the opportunity for people to do this sort of stuff anymore, especially not in Australia. And I was able to work for a Silicon Valley company in the UK and go through a training program and learn all this properly from a big team. We had hundreds of people, some people that had you know, 30 years experience. So uh, I was very lucky to have that. Uh, unfortunately, people today don't have that, but we also have the internet and all sorts of other cool ways to learn these things. So, um, yeah, so flipping forward, uh, after I left Recom, uh, the year 2000 was coming and I, went, I was in debt and I wanted to earn money, so I went off and said, forget all this embedded stuff, I'm going to go and earn lots of money and work in finance and business software, and I just ended up forgetting a lot of my embedded stuff and actually going and working on uh, apps and web development and for a dark age of probably uh, 10 or 12 years. And it was only sort of in more recent times, actually when I uh, went to a Linux conf, I think, uh, and I did uh, John Oxer's, and I met John, John Oxer and some of those guys, and I met Vic Oliver doing the 3D printing, that I started realizing there was this electronics thing was going to be huge, this hobbyist electronics. And I, I better start getting back into all the stuff I used to be in. So, um, and this is really one of the things that really uh, started a lot of this stuff off. So does anyone know what this is? So this is the, so you say Arduino, yeah. That's, uh, you, this is actually the Atmega, Atmel Atmega 328 processor. That is, uh, so people often think this is Arduino, but this isn't Arduino. This is the processor that uh, allows Arduino to be what it is. And uh, this has been around a very long time, actually, uh, way, way before we had all this hobbyist stuff. I actually have a client of mine uh, in Brisbane that have these modules. This is a legacy module. It's very old. And this is actually an AVR chip, too. It's not a 328. It's another old one. And these guys, uh, this is for a big bakery machine. We had to retrofit and do some crazy stuff with them. Uh, using these modules. Um, they um, used um, proprietary tools for development. This is the AVR Studio, which you can only get on Windows. They are using AVR GCC, so there is some open source in this here. There's also a lot of proprietary software around embedded development. You can go and buy all sorts of compilers, spend lots and lots and lots of money. Um, and, some of, and most of it is Windows only. It's pretty rare you get Linux stuff. So uh, that's sort of something that really kind of annoys me a little bit. Um, down the track though, we had Arduino, so these guys in Italy came up with the Arduino, which was putting this uh, AVR chip, which is uh, it's upside down, but that's the same chip, you see the 328P, uh, onto a nice little dev board, um, providing very easy access via USB, and also um, we kind of love or hate it, but the Arduino IDE, which is a really, really what great way for people to access these things. Has anyone here used Arduino? You use this Arduino IDE, it's very familiar, this is the Blink program that everyone runs. This is the hello world of Arduino. So um, yeah, it's clunky and it doesn't always work. There's problems with serial ports, things like that. 
But what I like about this is it runs everywhere. I can get a Linux, Mac, Windows version. Kids can get started pretty easily. The hardest thing we usually have trouble with is just serial port USB drivers and things like this. This generally works quite well. So um, yeah, there's something in this, having something really nice and accessible that kids can get started. They don't have to, they can write their program all in one loop, in, in all one program. Um, and if you want to go a little bit more hardcore, you can even write a make file. So this is a quite a common make file. In Ubuntu, there's a uh, little make file. There's actually a repo for it. You can just install it. I think it's called Arduino make files. Anyone ever use this? No? OK, so I, I always like to go back to bare bones and have some ability to do something. So you can do that, but you can also write the same program, write a little make file. And then you can do things that uh, I'm used to in the old days, doing continuous integration and testing and all those sorts of things that come with the software world. I can start trying to do that with my embedded stuff. And if you have a look in this make file, it's not that hard to actually read. It's, a, um, it's just all AVR GCC. And it's not very long. I didn't put it in my presentation, but I'll leave you guys to go and do that. And this is on Windows, Mac, Linux as well. You can get it going quite easily. And, uh, and then you can do really, really nice fast builds and deploys and just very, very quickly deploy your code rather than having to sit there in the ID. If you've got a slow machine, sometimes this can take quite a while. If you ever run this on a real slow machine, it can take quite a while to build and upload. And then it finally says it didn't upload, you weren't connected or whatever. Whereas if you do a make file, you can go crust. Anyway, the, the, this talk was not supposed to be about Arduino, but I'm giving you a little bit of an intro. Um, so in Arduino, make files. So then something else came along a little bit later. Um, does everyone know what these are? It's kind of stupid, but I just asked the question. We have the, we have the Raspberry Pi here and the BeagleBone Black. There's others as well, but these are the two that have kind of really kind of taken the world by storm. And these were kind of bridging that gap between PCs and the Arduino. You can do a lot of things you can do on the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi, and especially the BeagleBone Black. There's some really, really good stuff you can do there. But it's also a, a, a general purpose PC. So you can plug a, 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 a monitor in, HDMI port, you've got USB ports, uh, they run Linux, full operating system, and um, you can do a lot more with them. But there's also a little bit of a cost to that. So I do have a BeagleBone Black here, if anyone wants to see one. That's still haven't got that one working. I have an issue with the um, boot loader on that one. But um, so these run a full operating system on them, so, um, which is awesome, and the fact that it's Linux is awesome, but sometimes that's just overkill. You don't want that kind of thing, so I, I was using these, but also longing sometimes for the Arduino and the thing that I can just run, and it will run for months, I don't have to worry about it, it doesn't crash, even though this is Linux, they do crash, so things happen, things get hot, and these get really hot. Has anyone got one? Leave them on a while, they can get really hot. Whereas uh, I don't have that issue with the uh, Arduino stuff. So um, I started just recently sort of thinking about, I started thinking about the, the, the past and history and thinking about um, the BeagleBone and the Raspberry Pi and thinking about what I do with Arduino and thinking well, maybe I should start having a little look outside of what I've been doing and see what else is around. So everyone kept telling me about this thing called the STM32. Has anyone heard about the STM32? So, and when, if you start looking at devices, looking at the chips that are on devices, the STM32 is everywhere. It, it's amazing. I just thought, I went in my garage last night, what have I got in the garage? This is an old uh, temperature, temperature monitors. They put these on uh, remote sites. They're battery power, they're temperature loggers. You just stick them on the wall and just leave them, come back months later and you can grab them off, plug them into USB and pull all the data off. And they're uh, really popular apparently. Anyway, it's STM32, I just opened it. Um, this is a door lock, it's a RFID uh, door lock from a German company that we worked with and it's an STM32. So you'll find STM32s all over and they're really, really cheap. That's why they're appearing everywhere. They have really, really cheap processes. I think in bulk they're like under a buck or something like that. Um, so the, yeah, STM32 is everywhere, so I thought I need to there's a lot of ARM processors that you can play with, but this is one that's around, I know it's cheap, and I thought I'd have a little look around and see what I could do with it. So if you go, um, is everyone following me so far? I hope I haven't lost people. If you have any questions, just pipe up. So this is uh, what they call an STM32 discovery board, and you can buy these uh, on uh, lots of different places. I got this one from Element 14, and I think it was $12. 
with free shipping. And there's an interesting story around dev kits. When I was uh, in the old days, when we bought dev kits, if you wanted to, when we were building this thing, if you wanted to buy a Motorola 68K, um, and to digress, does anyone know why the Motorola 68K is called the 68K? Anyone? Cores. Sorry? Number of cores? Yeah, almost, yeah. It's the number of gates, 68,000 gates. Have a look at how many gates there is in an Intel uh, <laughs> i7 or whatever. I think it's 2 billion or something. I can't mm. remember what it is. So the, the 68,000, to buy the dev kit for the 68,000 back then would have been thousands and thousands of dollars. You would have had to sign NDAs. You, often with the dev kits, you were, they would say you have to return them if you're not using them again. They were actually on long loan. The dev kits were really expensive. And it's really in more recent times with the rise of Arduino and all these sorts of things, it's gone the opposite way now. These are heavily, heavily subsidised. You might have like $100 worth of electronics on this board. But what uh, STM in this case here, they want you to have a great experience with their, with their CPU. They want you to get the dev kit, try it all out, have a great experience, and then go and buy thousands, tens of thousands of them. So they almost give them away, effectively. The $12 is just so that people don't just, people like us don't just order hundreds of them. <laughs> and you see here they actually have, I don't know if you can see this, is evaluation product license agreement, which you do have to read and sign apparently, but I've never seen anywhere where I have to actually sign it. Um, has anyone played with any of these? Has anyone heard of them or used them? You have? Yeah, okay. So, what's that? Sorry. I pressed a button, I shouldn't have. Um, so this one in particular, I didn't really care, I just wanted an STM32, I picked the cheapest one. Uh, it's got uh, a uh, MEMS gyroscope and e-compass on it, which is uh, it's a pretty decent one as well. Uh, it's got some buttons and LEDs, you can make all sorts of flashing lights and things like that. It's here, I had planned to plug it in and show you it all, but I'll, I'll do it later if anyone wants to. Um, comes with, uh, one of the cool things that these things come with, they come with full debuggers with proper JTAG support. You can do decent debugging. Whereas I don't know if you've used Arduino and you have to do, how do you debug Arduino? Anyone? What do you generally do? Yeah, what, do you, you, what are you doing though? You're generally printing F all over the place and all that stuff, yeah. <laughs> These things have proper in-circuit debuggers on them, so you can set breakpoints to all those nice things that you do in proper in, uh, software on a PC. And really, really powerful. So that comes with a nice debugger. Uh, they come, the software that comes with it is Windows only. Um, when you go on their website, it's really hard to find how to use these not on Windows. And they will point you to a whole load of proprietary vendors who will sell you nice big IDEs and all sorts of stuff to use it. So I think uh, someone told me the price, the $12 price as well, is also heavily subsidized by the tools vendors. So they actually push money back to the manufacturers in order to get their names and all of their links on their websites and things like that. So there is a little bit of a cartel sort of arrangement going on there. So. Um, STM32 though is, is a really, really nice processor and it's not unlike the ones you see on uh, Arduino and, um, sorry, on uh, the Raspberry Pi and um, BeagleBones and things like that. And there's a whole load of other ones. So um, this is where I was going to cut to a live demo, but I'll just tell you a little bit about some of my, oh, sorry, this, I'm going to show you something else which is really cool. This has just come out uh, and a lot, of, has anyone seen this little board? You, um, just got one here to show you. Um, it's, uh, there was a really cool Hack Day article on it. So it's the ESP20, sorry, go on. Is this that little Wi-Fi? Yeah, so I think it's the ESP2822. And basically that is a, a for, for $3. The price on C-Studio is $6, but you can get them on AliExpress for $3. Uh, that's a full Wi-Fi. Um, uh, it's got a processor and a Wi-Fi chip. You can even set it in AP mode and run that like a wireless access point. Um, there's, sorry, for, uh, so you can attach that to your Arduino, to any other processor. But what's cool, that's also got an ARM 32-bit processor on it too. And they've just released the SDK like a week ago. And there's some guys in the US doing range testing. If you YouTube search for them, they basically had an antenna in the back of their car driving along a freeway. They had to find a big, long, straight stretch of freeway. And they, with an antenna on these, because you can buy one with an antenna, they got like six kilometers. Uh, range. Uh, without the antenna, I think they got 4.7 kilometres. Uh, point to point on Omnis, I think they got uh, just under seven, it was about 700 metres or something like that for three bucks. 
So this is, but this has got a, a very, I looked at, looked at the price, I think it's called an LX16, LXO16, and that is uh, not unlike the STM32. Um, so you can see that the cost is going with this, a little bit like Yap said the other day, the cost of these IoT and wearable devices is effectively becoming zero. Uh, and this is called the ESP2822, I think I'm not sure if I said that quite right. I, I, um, I'll send it, I think I was meant to put it down the bottom, but I was trying to keep this presentation as text-free as possible, so yeah. my apologies. Sorry? Like I'll, find the, uh, I'll find the link for it. I think it's, uh, yeah. Anyway, they're really good. They're quite hard to get hold of at the moment, but there's a whole lot of articles written with them. And uh, I have a little Arduino board that currently works with a Wi-Fi UART that we buy for about $10, which is rubbish, it just doesn't stay stable. So we're just changing our little board to support this instead. So for like your kind of stuff, you might find this very, very, very useful, especially given the range. And the nice thing about this is this is proper Wi-Fi. It's not like a radio or any sort of low level radio. It's you can hook it into your home Wi-Fi. So the reason I was mentioning though this though, that this is a, this is a, a, a 32 bit ARM processor as well. And the, the ARM uh, processor is a, what they call a RISC CPU. I don't know if people know the difference between RISC and CISC, but uh, Arduino, the AVR processors are RISC too. So there's actually not that, not a great amount of difference between all of these RISC CPUs. And the, they, um, they borrow lots of ideas from each other and a lot of the SDKs are similar. So that's why a lot of the SDKs that are coming out are um, coming out quite fast because they can kind of stand on the shoulders of giants. And the uh, ARM core, the people that look after the ARM core, I can't remember the company, they license cores to all these various different ARM uh, manufacturers. Uh, there's a lot of um, collaboration now, I've noticed, going back to them. And I'll talk about it a little bit later. There's a thing called Embed OS that's being worked on, which is uh, hopefully going to bring a lot of this together. So, so what sort of power draw on that? Uh, I'd have to ask my hardware guy. <laughs> I can't remember. He's been testing it all week. That's why he's not at OSDC, because he's been working on this for an uh, accelerator program we're entering, and we're going to use these. So he's been doing a lot of experiments with them. So. 8266. 8266, yeah, that's right. Do so you get that? ASP 8266. If you look at the Hackaday article, that's a good place to start. It tells, sends you to a lot of data sheets and lots of interesting things. But these are these are uber cool. Um, the SDK, so they have some GPIO pins on them, so you can actually run just that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So I'm going for time so far. Is anyone keeping time? Because I'll just. So I'm 20 minutes in. 30 minutes in, 30 minutes left, okay. So this is my little tool chain. I tried a lot of different things. And these are the three things I kind of settled on for using the STM32. So um, to, do, to do any work with an embedded processor, you kind of sort of need three things. There's other things, but these are the three things you need. You need a compiler to compile your code to run on that CPU. You need some sort of way to debug and upload your code to the device. And thirdly, you often will need some sort of firmware or some sort of library on the device. You don't want to be really hard coding assembler on these things. And that's where basically Arduino has helped on the Arduino for AVR. It's created this kind of little, nice little, it's not really a firmware as such, but a library that allows you to do things easily. So in my case, uh, you have to use this thing called GCC ARM embedded. If you're on Linux, uh, who, who uses Linux here? Who uses Mac, Windows? Linux. So Linux, Mac. Windows. I didn't mean to say that in a low voice at the end. <laughs> Sorry, it just came out the way. That's okay. Um, you can get GCC for all of these. Uh, in Linux, there's a GCC ARM and there's a GCC ARM embedded. So just be aware they're different. GCC ARM is for Linux on ARM. GCC ARM embedded is for what I'm doing, which is bare metal on an ARM CPU. So you have to, from Ubuntu 14.04 that's built into the distro, from I think 12.04, you can go and install the PPA but it's very well uh, maintained. So I, I try and stick with things that are well maintained. I can see commits and I can see activity in the community. So I try to look. Um, the other one is this thing called OpenOCD. And OpenOCD is the uh, in-circuit debugger and all of that stuff. And it does all the uploading and handles all of that. And this is, a, again, a command line tool, but people have made little wrappers and nice IDE support. If you use Eclipse, you can get plugins that will link into OpenOCD. Um, it's very good. Seems to work really well. I emailed my friend in the US last night to say I was doing this talk, um, and she said, 
are you using OpenOCD? If you're not, I really need to know because she, that's what she's using and obviously she's got a few issues with it. So um, I'm going to have an interesting conversation with her in a week when I see her in the Silicon Valley uh, about all of this stuff because she's very much in this space and I'll talk about her book in a minute. And then finally, uh, you've got a little bit of choice here, but I, I've been using libopencm3, which is a, a library. It's not really an RTOS, it's a, and I'll describe the difference between RTOS and library in a minute. It's a, it's a set of libraries, not unlike Arduino, that allows you to do lots of things nicely on the ARM um, processor without having to write all this hardcore register stuff and go through these, you have to have all these various different things set to make anything blink. Just to do a blink program can be massive, whereas you know, libopencm3, it's quite easy. It's not unlike Arduino. And there's uh, some other options which are free RTOS, which is another GPL, uh, that's RTOS. So it's a real-time operating system, allows you to schedule and do multitasking and things like that. And this one is quite interesting called Embed, which wasn't open source until about a year ago. And they've now open sourced the whole thing. And it's a part of a huge consortium of all the ARM processors. They're trying to get under one brand. And Embed is bigger than just the embedded stuff. They have uh, three parts to it. They have the embedded OS. They also have a server component for people to be able to do easy IoT and things like that. And then they've got a tools, which is uh, um, nice GUI tools for all the different languages. And they've open sourced that. Uh, it's under an Apache license. Well, it's going to be MIT licensed, so they were just, but then they moved it to Apache. And uh, that's an interesting one to follow because it looks like when you go on their website, look at all the logos at the bottom, they've pretty much got every single manufacturer who's building ARM boards in that consortium. So, those are, if you want to follow um, my journey, you can read this blog post at the bottom here, which was all the various random things I tried. Um, so, that's the STM32. I have one here, and it's in a lot of different devices. I'll show you a few more in a minute. Um, if you do, if 32 bits a little bit much for you and you want to go back to the whole 8 bit world, uh, STM have a lot of 8 bit processors too, which are equivalent to the AVRs. The, co the cool thing about the STM 8s, they are so ridiculously cheap. You can get them under 10 cents, and the power usage is just absolutely minuscule. So if you really want to sort of go to the max, you can go to something like the STM 8s. And uh, they, have, uh, they have loads of different types. This is the confusing thing in general about all these ARM processors. It's bewildering. And I'll give you some ideas how to get around that in a minute. But there are a lot of different versions. If you go on to DigiKey, you'll see so many different versions of these dev boards. These are two, for instance. That's the uh, STMAS, and that's the STMAL. I think this one was $8, and this one was $10. And I'm like, oh, I don't know which one to order. I ordered the $8 one. I ordered the cheapest one. And uh, as a result, um, I got this, it's kind of cool, it's like a snap off. Apparently a lot of people buy it just for this programmer and they snap that bit off and chuck that bit away because it's actually kind of a really good debugger. So there's a whole load of these that get thrown away. There's a Hackaday article on them. It's the cheapest um, JTAG debugger board basically. Um, it comes with a whole load of other stuff. It's got a little touch sensor, you know those little capacitive touch things. They just randomly throw things on these dev boards just to kind of, it's, the idea is to create interest and get people thinking about projects. But yeah, if you're going to buy an estimate, just don't buy that. I wasted like a week trying to get that working and it was a pain in the ass. Um, the estimate L, which is actually a lower power version, is the one to go for, for STM8. This one comes with an LCD on it, so it's actually quite nice. And a few buttons and a few other things. And uh, if you want to see, uh, with STM8L, uh, STM8, um, this is, if you want to go totally open source, there's a, it's a bit harder work. Because basically the STM8, STM32 is everywhere. And everyone's doing 32-bit development now. No one's thinking about the poor old 8-bit stuff. But I quite like 8-bit. So, uh, uh, with STM8, I use this thing called the STCC, which is a small device C compiler, which is really nice. It's got support for lots of different 8-bit processors, not just the STM8. And I use a tool. It's just an open source tool by some Russian guy, uh, Vladimir or something. I can't remember his name. Uh, he wrote this STM8 flash tool. You can actually read the code. It's actually quite easy to read. It's not too complicated doesn't have all the nice debugging that you have on 32. And he's written some nice examples that come with it. He's got a Blinky and a few other examples. So I've just, I haven't done too much with STM8 because um, I've actually backtracked to using some Arduino stuff. Um, since learning about the STM8, I've, it's, it's really good to try these things out because it realizes what's, what you really get a scope for where, where you are with what you're doing, what's around you. So um, back to the STM32. Anyone questions so far? Have I lost you all? Is this okay? No. 
Um, STM32 is, as I said, is everywhere. It's, uh, it's, it's spawning some really interesting little projects, though, that are coming out of it. So this is a thing called the Spark IO. So has anyone heard of Spark IO? <laughs> um, <laughs> this is the guy. It's awesome. Um, this is a, a kick, it was a Kickstarter originally, but it's now gone crazy. And Spark IO is basically it's an STM32 baseboard with Wi-Fi. It's got a Texas Instruments Wi-Fi chip on there as well, and it's it just comes like that. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive. Um, what's nice about this is they have a it's all cloud-based. All the development you don't have to do. It's got their own. Uh, little operating system on here. It's all open source. They've got all the hardware open source. You can look at all the schematics, everything. Uh, you write in a very, very Arduino-like interface. And they've actually ported most of the Arduino libraries to it. So you code in the cloud in a web browser. And then when you're done, you upload to the device. It goes all the way up through the internet cloud back to your device. And then you can, you're away. So you can do remote coding on your system. I had This was from a weather station. You could. I could code on it and push new code down to the weather station and you'll always, in theory, you don't ever brick it, you can always get to the, the chip. Um, it's still a little bit under development, there's a few things that kind of don't always quite work on it, but it's getting there. And you basically pair it to your Wi-Fi network using a special mobile phone app on Android, iPhone, and all that. It does a special peer-to-peer Wi-Fi link when they first start up and tells the, what the real Wi-Fi network is and then joins the real Wi-Fi network. And there's some handy LEDs on there. But that is all driven by the STM32 as well. So if you want to do ARM development but you don't want to do the hardcore stuff, these are really good. Uh, you do give away a little bit of performance because there's a whole emulation layer in there. But um, these are really nice. I'm very impressed with what they've done. Um, this is another one. Has anyone seen this before? No? Anyone? Yes? So this is the, uh, sorry? That's right. This is called the Electric Imp. So the Electric Imp is uh, similar to Spark IO. It's not open source, though. Uh, but I'll just mention it. Uh, basically, it comes like that in an SD card. So that's the chip. It's got an STM32 and also a Wi-Fi chip in there. And then they've got a whole load of different dev boards you can plug into. And as a product, uh, if you create a product, you can also put a slot in your product. Apparently, they're going in washing machines and all sorts of things now. You just go get electric kit and put that in, and that becomes your IoT device. And again, you code in the, on the web. It's all done in the cloud. They have a little language called Squirrel that they use, which looks very much like JavaScript. And uh, you code this, the, the, it's quite neat the way they've done it. You, the, the, the web browser's split into two. The top bit is the agent code and the bottom bit's the web code. You write the agent code that runs on here and then the web code is the bit that runs on the web. And when you want to send something from the agent to the web, you basically just do a send and then that's all encrypted. It's all handled for you. They've got the whole layer in between and the, and the data just magically appears at the other end and in, on the web component. Um, I just mention it here because it uses the STM32. It's not particularly open source. They've actually, uh, I think they have open sourced the OS that runs on this, but the way it all works with the cloud is all uh, their secret source. But what they do is actually run a virtual machine on the STM32. So there's a hypervisor which actually runs your code. So the, pl the point of the thing is that you never ever brick it. You can never brick it because the main uh, host operating system is always there and the virtual machines just get loaded in and out. So they, they, they've basically built this with stability in mind. So that, and, and it's basically, it's targeted at web developers. It's embedded stuff for web developers. So um, that's where they've gone with that. So that's the, um, that's the electric imp. So um, yeah, I was just going to finish on um, basically where do you go from here if you're interested in any of this stuff. So uh, I said before, it's, it's bewildering. There's so much stuff they can do. And um, one of the number one things I can really recommend to people is to uh, start reading and listening and getting out there and listening. Uh, one of the best things I've found is listening to this podcast at the top called The Amp Hour. If you want to brush upon your electronics, these guys are awesome. Um, and it's actually Dave Jones is one of the hosts. He also runs the EV blog. So this is very electronics based. And then the... the, the, uh, the sorry? Podcast. This one's a video podcast, uh, YouTube. It's one of the most popular, uh, it is the most popular electronics YouTube in the world. And he lives in Sydney, Dave does. He's really cool, like, if you want to connect with him, he's awesome. 
he'd probably be very interested in what you're doing actually. He's, uh, he's, he's, yeah, he's, he's a bit crazy. You've got to watch his videos. You'll see. Has anyone else watched it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, they're just a bunch of dickheads. It's like his standard thing he says. Um, <laughs> and uh, another uh, really cool podcast is this one called Embedded. And this is by my friend Alicia White, who lives in San Jose. And uh, I actually wasn't friends with her until I listened to this podcast. And I ended up listening to the podcast a lot. And when I went over there, I kind of called her up and said, do you want to catch up? And we ended up meeting her and her husband. And we kind of become sort of long distance friends. And um, she's got this really awesome book, which she wrote. Um, she's done a lot of really cool work stuff. She worked on Fitbit and all sorts of embedded devices. She's an embedded programmer and she's really into the uh, bare metal stuff as well. So actually getting with the OS and just going down, getting right down to it. So she wrote this book called Making Embedded Systems. Uh, O'Reilly, she took a year of her life to read this book, write this book. And um, she's done a really good job and she wrote the book with the view that it wouldn't age very much. The, a lot of the concepts in here are really, when I read through it, I think back to a lot of my mentors when I was working in 3Com originally, they were saying a lot of the same things. So I'd really recommend this book. Um, I, I can give you a nice discount code as well that she's given me this morning, which gives you 50% off. Uh, it's called, uh, if you go to O'Reilly.com and the co code is AuthD, I believe. Um, that will give you, I think, 50% off the ebook and 40% off the print book. But their postage is a bit high to Australia, so you might just want to get the ebook. It's a really, really good read. Um, so, yeah, and the, really the number one thing that you can do is go to a hackerspace, because this is where you'll really learn a lot. I, I don't know everything. I might sound like I do, but I actually don't. I'm just kind of faking a lot of this, because a lot of this knowledge comes from my friends at the hackerspace, and we all help each other. That's how you really learn. And this is going back to what Yap was saying with networks. And you know, we are bigger than some of our parts, actually uh, often very much bigger than the sum of our parts. And if you can connect with hackerspaces around the world, this is definitely where your telescope theory comes in, Yap. Because I've visited um, hackerspaces all around the world. Now I've been to Shanghai. I've been to ones in the west coast of the US. Next time I go home to the UK, I'll be probably hunting out the hackerspaces, trying to form these links between hackerspaces. The Australian hackerspaces, we all, uh, the presidents of all the Australian hackerspaces communicate. We have got links between all of the major cities here. And it's a really great way to learn. And you'll have massive accelerated learning by going to hackerspaces. I cannot recommend that enough. And hackerspaces have branched out into lots of other different areas now. It's not just electronics. There's all sorts of co-working spaces, media spaces. There's people doing wearable. They're specialising in all sorts of different things. Um, so I'd highly recommend that. Uh, do you go to the Melbourne Hackerspace, Richard? Are you involved with that? They, um, that's where, there's a guy called John Oxer. If you know John, he was involved in the Melbourne Hackerspace originally. He runs Freetronics. And Ron, uh, uh, John has made a whole business out of Arduino and electronics. And this is like one of his latest products, which is a 4x4x4 four by four by four cube kit. And um, he's done a really good job of this. If you saw this in a shop, you would, it looks very much like a a kit you would buy in the shops and it's very well done. It's got a really nice getting started card. Everything's packaged nice. It doesn't feel like a hobbyist product. And um, John's done very well uh, with that. And um, so I like to support John. And uh, he was involved in the Melbourne Hacker Space. Um, going a little bit out there, we've also got Hacker Day. So has everyone here seen Hacker Day? Everyone use Hacker Day? So Hacker Day are awesome. They did a recent Hacker Day challenge, which I don't know if they've called the winner yet. I think it's in final judging. Uh, to win a trip to space is the win is the prize. And after the crash a couple of weeks ago, I'm not sure if <laughs> <laughs> many people will want to take that prize. But you can take a cash equivalent. But they've um, put some serious money behind um, electronics and hobbyists and things like that. And then uh, you might this might be a weird one to put in a slide about electronics, but. Uh, I've been following this site quite a bit lately, uh, F-Success. Does anyone use F-Success? So this is a little bit out there, but F-Success is uh, like Angel List, TechCrunch, a lot of those websites, it's got startups listed on there. And uh, everything's tagged. So you can go and browse through the tags and look at all the different startups. You can also look at accelerator programs where uh, there are co-working spaces, where there's uh, freebies, all sorts of things. But if you're looking for, if you've got a hobbyist idea and you think you might want to take that to something commercial, it's a really good idea to go have a look and look around the world and see what's happening. And like for instance, uh, one of our members, he's not here, uh, Ben, who's had the big robot. Did anyone go to Ben's talk, the big robot? So Ben was asking me about uh, accelerators in robotics and we 
we went on F6S and just clicked the robotics tag. And there was like 12 different accelerators offering seed funding for robotics startups. Some of them were offering like $100,000. So there's lots of money around. I'm part of a wearable accelerator, which is starting in a week in San Francisco, which is, uh, I'm going to be there working on a product, a wearable product I have. But I've also applied to an accelerator in Missouri, St. Louis, which is around ag tech. So we're working specifically around farming. And they give six $100,000 seed equity um, funding um, grants for startups. So there's lots of money around in this IoT electronic space. Um, and um, that was really my final thought around that. If anyone wants to, uh, I'll give you the code for the book. And I had a final slide. It's not really very connected, but I just really liked it. I saw it on Twitter yesterday. Uh, this is, this is uh, guys in the First World War, 1912, I think, something. And, uh, they've, they, uh, and this is really talking about maker culture and how sort of uh, um, necessity is the mother of all invention. So these guys made their own armor. Like the, their, their chances were not great in the First World War. They made their own armor. And uh, there's, or if you go on the web, there's all sorts of crazy armors that they made. And this guy here, we were having a laugh at him because uh, he obviously nicked the armor off someone else because <laughs> there's a pretty fatal hole there. And he's obviously just hoping he doesn't get hit in the same place. But uh, you know, these guys, are, they just fashioned something out of whatever they had around them. So um, this is what really we have in the hacker makerspace uh, area. We're doing the same thing. Um, I'm going to do a talk, hopefully, in my lightning talk today about my chickens. And uh, we have all sorts, I know a few people who mess around with monitoring chickens. And it's just kind of a necessity, you know, we're kind of interested in what they're up to. And, you know, if they're laid. Before the <laughs> this one? <laughs> There's some even crazier ones, but I just like this one. And it was an article on, um, uh, yeah, I can't remember what article, where I saw it on Twitter. I'll find the source of it. Um, but I thought that was really good to leave you on. So uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, yeah? Uh, if I would introduce this to my grandsons, mm -hmm. The, the Arduino kit is really good. I don't have my kit with me. Um, there's a kit that John Oxer makes. It's a, a kit It has 10 projects in it. Comes with an Arduino and a load of projects. It's not an ARM one that I was talking about today, but for kids, Arduino is a good place to start. But if they want to do um, more in the way of uh, like a, a more home PC, then the Raspberry Pi and the, uh, okay, okay. is a good one too. What's the age? Oh, well, um, it's a good question. Um, I've had seven-year-olds doing Arduino going through. We've had uh, five-year-olds doing Raspberry Pi stuff uh, using Scratch. And Scratch has actually got some user interfaces you can hook into electronics as well. I just read the other day they've got a new... Do you know what Scratch is? Have you seen it? It's from MIT. It is a, basically a very visual programming language for doing things. They've just created a new one, which is basically for kids before they can even read. And it's all symbolic. They can have kids, I think, from age three or four playing this, uh, doing this scratching. It's all based around symbols and they can write programs. And that's from the same people. So you can start really young. Like I, I was seven when I started programming and to give you a funny story, this is the Sinclair Spectrum. It was invented by Sir Clive Sinclair. He was a really brilliant inventor in the UK. And he, he was kind of mocked a little bit for this computer because it was quite under spec compared to some of the other computers. It had very crappy sound. Yeah, the ZX80. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was a bit mocked. The, the colors, the graphics weren't as good. The sound wasn't as good. One of the things he did, which I really like, was uh, he put all the basic keywords on the keys here. Can you see that? I don't know if you can see that very well. So, yeah, yeah. So normally, if you had a Commodore 64 and you wanted to load a game, you would type L O A D, no, d, d enter. With this, you would do uh, J, go, go, enter. And most time people would just load games. But then you would see all these keywords and go, well, what are all these keywords? And you could actually program, learn to program by, um, by basically by um, trial and error. Basic. Yeah, you could do it. You could see like a for loop. You'd type four, and then the attribute thing would pop up and go and tell you, oh, you've got to put like a, a number in there now. So you, oh, OK, for one, two, five. 
And you could actually, and I started programming actually just by randomly doing the keys when I was seven. Um, and, and you can, it's amazing what you can do. And then you start reading computer magazines and things like that. So that's what uh, is happening with a lot of this other stuff. You've got things like the um, OLPC laptops, ra um, the Raspberry Pi. There's a, it, they're leaving the kids just to basically use their intuition a lot of the time to start doing things. And Raspberry Pi, uh, sorry, Scratch is a good one because there's a whole marketplace of, they can say, well, I don't quite know what to do. I'll see what else there is. And they can pay a project and other kids don't and say, oh, oh, you can do uh, bouncing things off walls. OK, I'll try and work out how to do that. Um, so um, that whole spirit of discovery is very alive in the electronics side as well. Um, there's really nothing you can do that's really that bad with Arduino. It's all five volts, uh, low voltage. Uh, sometimes things can get a little bit hot if you move them the wrong way around. But there's no dangerous, uh, life-threatening, um, nothing that's going to kill you. So the kids can play around and learn. and do that so um, yeah the, the earlier the better my son is nine he isn't so into the electronics but he's very into the programming and stuff my daughter likes to wire things up and she's six she was doing that when she was four she used to put things in breadboard for me and poke little things in so yeah just start them off <laughs> any other questions no sorry no <laughs> <laughs> any other questions or comments or anyone wants to see anything or this is a, just while I'm talking, this is a, has anyone ever heard of this guy? Forrest Mims, anyone? He's something of a superstar in the US. Uh, he wrote these books, which were very, very, very popular. And there's a great uh, um, interview with him on the Ampower. If you go back maybe 15 episodes, you might find it, Forrest Mims. And he uh, wrote these books, these electronics reference books. And uh, he wrote them all by hand. Or with one pen, basically. He sat at his kitchen table and actually scribed them all out. There's not any typed uh, text in there. And it, they're actually brilliant to read because you're like, yeah, he prints out everything. But this is his handwriting. I can just imagine him sitting at his kitchen, like actually writing these out. Is that recently? This one was in 1986. The original ones, I think, were even back in the 70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he did about six different books. And if you go to the US in Radio Shack, they sell them in Radio Shack just on the shelf. I bought this one on Radio Shack. I had limited baggage, so I only bought one. I really wanted to buy all of them. So I'll buy all of them when I go back next week. Um, if you want to learn about electronics and learn in kind of a fun way, this is really good. This is all pre-Arduino, so the, but they've got all sorts of 555 circuits and not even 555s. You can make, uh, like, I, I, I found some really interesting things in here, like, uh, you can make things you can do with diodes that I had no idea you could do with. Um, yeah, you can make basically transistors with diodes just by putting diodes in, ways, in certain ways. And uh, he's really cool. But yeah, listen to his talk. It's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And uh, the two interviewers are almost like in awe because he's like, you know, they, they, they just can't believe they got him on the show. Uh, <laughs> but those books are really good if you want to learn about electronics. Um, uh, I think everyone should learn some electronics. Uh, one of the things I was just going to uh, say to someone before is that, uh, yeah, when I was uh, learning this, and uh, we were thinking, I wasn't thinking about a job in software, but I did end up in software. Now you've got all these hobbyists doing electronics in, in the next few years. It's already happening now. There are going to be a lot of jobs in electronics. So I think the best thing we can teach our kids is some electronics. Uh, there's going to be there's not going to be many other jobs <laughs> if you read some. If you have a look on YouTube for a, a YouTube called Humans Need Not Apply. Has anyone watched that? <laughs> yeah. There's some pretty scary stats in there. I don't know. I don't agree with everything he says, but yeah, around jobs and what jobs are going to get automated and, and turned into done by robots. And it's like 45% of our jobs, like the top 100 jobs are all ripe for me mechanization. And uh, so we're going to need electro good electronic engineers and good embedded software engineers, actually good, soft good engineers in general everywhere. So yeah, the best thing you can do if you've got kids is uh, teach them about engineering. Uh, I'm actually finished, so uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>